the one and only Phil Soucy, the cat man, joins us on this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, and we're going to talk about a part of hunting that is so important. Phil is the world-renowned big cat taxidermist, and I asked Phil to come on the podcast to help us understand the things that he needs for us as hunters to do to help him be successful in his job in creating beautiful taxidermy artwork once that critter has hit the ground. So we're going to go through it all with Phil. He's going to walk us right through the train wrecks he's seen, how to avoid them, everything from bullet selection to how to ship it. It's all here, folks. You're going to love it. Before we get to the podcast, I've got to make a couple announcements. Seth and I met in East Texas for Apocalypse 2024, and we put the smack down on some hogs. My trip was about 10 days long, so I hunted Louisiana and then moved over and met in East Texas. And let me tell you what, those East Texas boys have got some hog dogs now. Danny Butts and his pack of rebel curs down there, his catch dogs, everything he's got going on is legit. And they put us in the hogs, and we absolutely put the smack down on them. We've got YouTube content that you're going to be seeing coming up, so I encourage you to jump over there to YouTube, find our channel, and make sure you're keeping an eye out for HXP TV. Seth is going to cover it all on that that great platform right there so that you can get some audio visuals of our exciting hunts. I also want to give you guys a big shout out and a thank you for your overwhelming response to Elite Nutrition products on our website. It's been amazing. You guys are hearing what what we're putting out there. You're, You're listening to the podcast and now you are moving on to that Elite Nutrition level to help you achieve extreme performance. You can check out all of the Elite Nutrition products on our website at houndsmanxp.com in the shop. We reorganized everything. Stuff is super easy to find. Everything's categorized, and you can find Elite Nutrition products there. And I'm just going to tell you that normally when – I mean, I, sh- I went hunting with soft dogs. I'm not going to lie. They Cajun and Diablo, since bear season, haven't been hunted a whole lot, and they held up. They held up, their body condition held up, and um, I just packed the Elite Nutrition pre-mixed in my feed before I went. I do want to give you a heads up on something, though. As we're moving into warmer weather, I strongly encourage you to mix smaller doses or batches, batches of dog food using the essential dog and any probiotic, pro and prebiotic that you're going to add to feed I I encourage you to do that in smaller batches. The Essential Dog has probiotic and prebiotic, and the Happy Dog Plus has probiotic and prebiotic. What happens when you mix that with feed, it will activate above 70 degrees. So if you're traveling with dog food, and I got lucky, this did not happen to me, but it was close. I was right there on that borderline. It, it, it was getting above 70 degrees. I kept my feet in the shade. I kept it cool. But what happens, it will activate, and it will actually start digesting that dog food in the barrels. So as we're moving into these hotter temperatures, make sure that you're mixing Happy Dog Plus and the Essential Dog in smaller doses, or you're going to ruin a lot of feed. That's it for me and all the announcements that I have right now. I know this has been a long pre-roll. You want to listen to Phil Susie? It was a great interview. I think you're going to love it. And the guy's a lion hunter himself, has his own hounds. Here it is, folks. This is a box shaker. It's time to dump the box. All right, if you spend any time on in any hunting lodges around the country, I've seen this man's mounts all over the world. And... Um, Re- highly recognizable and probably the most, in my opinion, one of the most well-known cat taxidermists on the planet. And it just seems like, seems like you can walk into a lodge and look at a mountain lion mount. And if it's, if it's a Phil Susie mount, you know it right away. Phil, I, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast and uh, talk to us today. So welcome. 
Thank you. I I consider it a privilege to to get to do this with you today. So absolutely, absolutely. I was walking through the SCI shows, Fire Club International in Nashville, uh, just a couple weeks ago, and um, walked by a, an outfitter's booth, and I looked up, and there was a leopard, and there was a mountain lion. And I said, how long ago did Phil Susie do your mounts? And the guy was amazed that he automatically knew that I knew <laughs> where those came from. So I can't remember the gentleman's name. He was from Utah, but, but your stuff is so recognizable. And um, it's totally, totally different than, um, you know, what we normally see. But no doubt about it. Escondido Lodge down in, in, uh, on the Paloma Ranch down in New Mexico has one of your mounts there. So hmm. how did you get started in taxidermy? Well, I've always had a fascination with it. I mean, from the time I was a little kid, every time we went by a taxidermy shop, I would try to get my dad to stop. And <laughs> he was, he was old school, you know, he'd just cut the horns off of antlers off of a deer and, and hang them in the rafters in the garage. And we had no taxidermy in our house growing up when I was growing up, but um, I've just always had a fascination with it. And we, we did have a taxidermy shop. I grew up in Spokane Valley, Washington. Uh, we had a taxidermy shop about five blocks down the road and you, you couldn't keep me out of there. I was just a nuisance. Uh, I swept up for the guy at times and uh, I, I just loved being there, but it wasn't until after I got out of high school that I actually uh, had an opportunity to work in a studio. I had come back to Washington. I, my parents had moved us to Texas. I'd come back to Washington and shot this deer and uh, wanted to have it mounted, but I didn't ever save the cape. And so I was living in Midland, Texas at the time, and I took it to a taxidermist and he offered uh, to find me another cape. And between the time that he got around to mounting it or the time I took it in and the time he got around to mounting it, he advertised in the paper for a taxidermy apprentice. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I was working at the phone company at the time, but I had to have that job. So I offered to work two weeks for him for free. And if he didn't like the way I worked, uh, he didn't have to hire me. And so he had me digging fence post holes in hundred <laughs> plus degree heat in August in, in that hard caliche for two weeks. And, I eventually it got me the job, but uh, I started out mountain whitetails and, and small mammals, foxes and bobcats and things like that. So this, I worked there. Uh, so this guy advertised, he wanted a taxidermy apprentice and what he needed was yeah. a fence builder. Uh, I think <laughs> I stepped in that. I, I think he probably would have put me to work right in the shop, but I wanted, there, there was like 60 people that applied for that job. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I just, I just knew that was my destiny. And so uh, that was in August, actually August 27th, 1984. So we're looking at 40 years this year that, that I started, I was 21 years old and that's all I've ever done, you know, as vocation, it's a career. Yeah. And since, since then, and um, I, I had, I've really had the privilege. I got very homesick for the Northwest. Um, I left Texas went to the Portland area and, and hit a guy up for a job named Bill Lancaster. And Bill Lancaster was a pretty notorious houndsman, but he was the best, probably the best mountain lion taxidermist at the time. Right. I spent three, three years working with him. He's now moved to Idaho. He left Oregon, you know, about the time they banned hound hunting there mm -hmm. and just so he could still hunt dogs. And he became, a very renowned sculptor sculpted has sculpted a bunch of mannequins and is probably still sculpting into his eighties now, but he was very uh, instrumental in, in shaping my philosophy towards competition. And, and he, he just, he did everything right. He was a perfectionist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good person to learn from. So what came first, your love of hounds and lion hunting? and hunting big cats or, uh, you know, the taxidermy side of it. He introduced me to hounds. He, he oh. mainly bear hunted. He mainly bear hunted. He had plots, but, but he cat hunted as well. You said and he had, had plots, but 
I've got I've got plus. No, I said, but... no, I said and <laughs> and <laughs> no, no, but but he cat hunted as well. He actually had had a, a really really good cat dog plot, and he hunted with another fella uh, quite a bit named Terry Boyer, and and his son Mark Boyer is, is carrying that tradition on. Um, but every weekend, he, these guys had rigs built that that had sleepers in the back window. You can climb in the back of the canopy, and they had these uh, dog boxes that were kind of hidden in their toppers. They were they were very. It's not like today. They didn't, mm-hmm. they had dogs on the hood, um, but, but they were, they were pretty covert in everything they did. They didn't take pictures. Um, they hunted a lot of timber company land. They had damage permits and they yeah. were, they were pretty serious about killing bears. Mm-hmm. And they, they felt that you, you can't get a whole lot of people into cat hunting or you'll, you'll just cut your own throat. But he said, you can promote bear hunting all you want because at that time, um, well, and still is to, to maintain, to, to build and maintain a good pack of bear dogs is very costly. It costs a lot of marriages and vehicles and jobs. And man, you're not lying. <laughs> I mean, you're not lying. The sacrifice for those guys was great. So they were all self-employed, you know, <laughs> I've totaled trucks. I've spent the grocery money and everything in pursuit of trying to build a pack of bear dogs. And, and I still can't say that I've got one, you know, it's, it's, uh, luckily I've got, I know where to draw the line. You know, I know when I'm pushing the envelope a little too far at home and when to dial it back, but I didn't always do that. I mean, <laughs> thank goodness yeah. I had a patient wife. Yeah. Um, he, we did Bobcat hunt a bit and, and I really enjoyed that. I loved it. And so, uh, I, I went from Oregon to, I, I always wanted to live here in Libby. I had relatives here that, that mm-hmm. I would come and visit in the summer. And uh, I met a taxidermist here in the mid eighties and it just never worked for me to come work for him. So I, I left Oregon and went to Reno and worked for Mike Boyce for a few years. And, and that, that was very instrumental in, in shaping the way I viewed taxidermy and it, it opened the world to, um, you know, going deeper into life-size taxidermy. But it wasn't until I moved up, left Reno and moved to Libby that I got my first hound of my own. And it was a, he was a walker dog. Uh, there was a couple guys in Northeast Oregon that, that raised these, these housebred dogs. And I, I don't know the exact breeding of him, but he, he didn't get along with another dog that, that this gentleman had. And uh, I got him cheap. And he was my first hound, and he he was a great lion dog uh, in the snow. You know, you, mm-hmm. you have to keep in mind, hunting here uh, in the '90s was was the easiest form of cougar hunting that there was. We had tons of deer, we had tons of cat cats, lots of snow, lots mm-hmm. of roads, and uh, I mean, you you could go out on a weekend and catch five lions. Yeah, uh, if you hunted with somebody else, it was. That, that was pretty common. Mm-hmm. And so you could have a young dog at 40 or 50 trees um, his first winter. If, if you really, if, if you skip school a little bit. Right, right. But, but so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't compare what I was doing or what most of these guys here are doing to what guys do in the dirt in the Southwest. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, those guys, they have to be dedicated to it. And, and, and you can't, you can't just hunt weekends and catch 30 lions. You can't do that. Whereas here you could still do that. I would say, uh, once the, the wolves got established, it, that changed everything. Right. I mean, you, you just the amount of animal uh, lion tracks you'd turn out on or bobcat tracks, uh, you, you know, people became fearful. I became fearful after a wolf wreck. And, uh, and so it, it, it just changed how, how many races you could have. We, uh, Anytime we hunted the Swan Valley there, you know, we would run the, we would run the roads in the morning and the trails and different things on, uh, machines. And if we found a cat track, then we spent the next two hours looking for wolf tracks to see if anything crossed into that section before we even went back and turned loose on a, on a lion track. And, um, it, it was amazing how many wolf tracks we saw wolves, 
uh, we were actually going to turn loose on a, on a, a male and a female. We were just chasing, uh, we had mm -hmm. a, a male and a female together and, uh, man, it was a good track. It was fresh. The snow was fresh. Everything looked good. I looked up on the mountain and saw the wolves running and they ran down the mountain and that just mm. did it for us. We were just like, nope, not here. Not today. Yeah. It's I have a, friends that hunt that. It's a real problem. I have problem. some friends that hunt that country now. And uh, it, it's amazing. I don't know what's so much different about that ground, but there are guys that can hunt those things, like herd them around on sleds, and the wolves are not s such an issue there. Even here, we still have lots of wolves, but they have come – to the, they're not as brazen as they were when they were first delisted and they've come to associate hounds with people. And mm -hmm. so in those early days, if they could hear your dogs, your dogs were in peril. Right. Um, for sure. Now, now I've run and I know I've bumped wolves multiple times, uh, just going in there and finding the tracks and, and they opted not to kill dogs. So uh, that's an improvement. Yeah, they're a lot more cautious now. There's still risk, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, since they delist, and I don't want to sidetrack this thing on a big wolf discussion. We've covered this stuff a lot, but I tried to talk, uh, and it's not done yet, but Gary Robertson with Burnham Brothers Game Calls just came out with a new uh, high-frequency caller, and I tried to talk him into putting um, hound sounds in that in that box so that so that wolf hunters could use it and we could condition the wolves when they hear hounds that's not mm -hmm. good we don't go there when we go there one of our buddies dies and educate them that way a little bit i'm still working on that <laughs> it's it's a good theory i don't know how it's going to prove out I, i've yeah i don't know a either. lot of times a lot of times the wolves will will come uh, and keep some distance and then you go back to that tree the next day and the wolves will come to that tree but mm. um, yeah yeah. So it's, it's a whole different, it's, yeah, that's a battle of itself. Well, let's, let's get into what we, you know, obviously we want to talk about your taxidermy and, uh, uh, we want to talk about one of the things that I see a lot on social media and I get messages myself, people will see me outline hunting somewhere and, uh, they know I'm from back East. And so they ask me, where can I go lion hunting? Where, you know, where, would you recommend going things like that? And, um, the, one of the things that I see a lot is, man, this is a bucket list hunt for me, this, and we get there and then we take our hounds and we get lucky enough. And maybe we bush a, a lion or something like that. And a guy will take a lion, but once it's on the ground, it becomes a whole different, um, a whole different experience at that point. You know, you're taking in cats from around the world. You're seeing, I don't know how many you're mounting a year, but I want to talk about what we do after we decide that we're going to, we're going to, you know, take a cat. We're going to kill it. Now we got it on the ground. I've, ton, I've skinned tons of animals, but everything back East is deer, white tailed deer, case skin and coons uh fox things like that when you got to start skinning an animal for you to be able to work with for and and we want to call this thing the bucket list hunt hunt of a lifetime whatever we want to call it uh we gotta we gotta skin this critter in a way that it can be properly memorialized and and give you something to work with yeah for sure um there's two kinds of damage that we deal with. Some is natural uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that the cat in, incurs in everyday life or even during the, de the death process. And then there's man-made. And a lot of the man-made stuff, most of it can be prevented. Not all of it. Um, yeah. There are things that, th things that, you know, to back up, I would say um, before the cat is even har has been harvested, um, weapon selection, bullet selection, broadhead selection, those things are very critical. You, you get, you get so many guys that want to take their 300 Remington ultra mag to the tree. I mean, I killed my elk with it. I want to kill my coo. It's dangerous game, right? 
Right. Well, right. It's, I would call Cougars semi-dangerous game. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the the fact is you're shooting thin-skinned game at point-blank range. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you happen to have one that's a baler and you're trying to shoot it, pop it from a ledge at 300 yards across a canyon or something, which which is rare, you're shooting thin skin game at point blank range. Often a cougar does not position itself in a tree that lends itself to, to exposing vitals, too. It may be bunched up. There may be limbs, twigs in the way. And and that makes it especially trouble troublesome for, for an archery hunter. Um just a little bit of an angle can cause an arrow to skip down the side of a cat and, and make a, a huge hole. Yeah. Um, whereas also a, a bullet can hit a bone, a humerus bone in the shoulder on the back side, and just fragment and take bone and jacket and all sorts of material with it out an exit hole. I mean, I've I've seen holes in cougars that you could I remember getting one that had a hole in the center of the back big enough that you could put your head right through it. It was like you could wear it as a poncho. Wow. And uh, there was a joke around the shop that <laughs> it was harvested by a guy that liked to do Civil War reenactments, and he took his cannon. <laughs> <laughs> but but high-velocity bullets, um, you know, 25-06. And, uh, I mean, we've killed a number of cats with 22 250s. Um, right. If you can, if you can hit them center of mass, but um, 243 is not ideal. You want a bullet that's going to stay together. Uh, they do, it doesn't take a lot of killing. Bullet placement, like in any other game, is is critical. So if you can get mm-hmm. it in the boiler room, lungs, heart. Um, I had a a kid with me this year that hunted all year last year, and he had his dad's 35 Remington or his, his grandfather gun his grandfather gave him and and he carried that around last year and we never did find a cat that he wanted to harvest but this year uh, a friend of his wife passed away and and gave his uncle this 218b an old lever action winchester and and he carried that and he harvested a cat with it which which is a little on the small end but you know he hit it had presented a good shot and he hit it right square in the in the brisket straight on and the cat fell out. I wouldn't say stone cold dead, but it didn't go anywhere. You know, right. it, it, it just laid there. And so uh, the bullet you choose, uh, I would much rather see a cat killed with a 357 than a 44, just because I've seen wh- what 44s can do with cats and dogs on the ground and stuff. Mm-hmm. But bullet placement is, is critical. Um, a 3030 is ideal. A 223 is, is a very good choice. Uh, the key, bullet, the, let's talk about bullet design a little bit. We've done a, we've done a little bit of work on this podcast about bullets and bullet design and things like that. And and uh, we were talking mainly about black bears at the time, which needs a different um, caliber and bullet. The first lion I ever killed was with a two twenty three, you know, and it was. I know several people that have have taken them with twenty two magnums. Um, Again, not ideal, but they can get the job done with shop placement and things like that. So let's talk about what you've seen from your own experience as a houndsman and, and then, you know, taking this animal into your, your studio and, and mounting it, doing the taxidermy work. What kind of bullets are you liking these days? I like a bullet that I can find it in the cat, <laughs> you know, that doesn't go, that doesn't exit. Uh-huh. Obviously, you don't, you don't want to use a 17 uh, HMR because, you know, it just doesn't have the penetration. But but a bullet that stays together, a copper bullet um, or something that's core bonded and, and not super high velocity. I mean, you could load something down, but um, just a 30-30 is, is ideal. A, a big, stout, thick Tom will stop a 30-30 if you hit him square in the chest. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, is that it's, it's, it's a light like- load like a straight on through the brisket chest or are you talking behind the front leg? Is it going to, you're going to get a pass through there? Well, if you shoot him behind the front legs, you'll get an exit, but that mm-hmm. bullet when it exits is, is not coming out fast enough to blow a huge hole. The key there is to try not to break bones. This is an African game where, you know, you've got to break the shoulder downfall, you know, <laughs> that's less than ideal 
we're not hunting leopards. And right. so, um, but yeah, just, just, uh, a, a, a slower, heavier bullet. And, and I think caliber is important. You know, if, if you're shooting something with a, uh, 44 70, it's going to make a bigger exit hole. You know, it just is. Right. Um, but it's not fast enough that it's going to just blow all mm -hmm. that shrapnel out the backside. So, so a bullet that stays together is, is important. That gets decent penetration. The Houndsman XP podcast is fueled by Joy Dog Food. Joy Dog Food has a rich tradition of supporting the Houndsman of America. Founded in 1945, Joy is proud of its history and the relationship it has built with the American Houndsman. And in 76 years, there's never been a recall. Made with 100% American-made high-quality ingredients, Joy Dog Food has one of the highest calorie-dense formulas on the market. For 76 years, this Made in America product has kept hunting dogs in the field day after day, season after season. And when we say Made in America, Joy has a long track record of fighting for American freedoms by being on the front lines against the animal rights movement and their extremist tactics. Joy will fuel your hounds and fight for your freedoms, fueled by Joy. The most comprehensive mapping system in the world is available by going to onxmaps.com and downloading their app. Several subscription offers there. Highly recommend you use an Onyx. And here's a true story for you. We've all got that spot where when we turn our hound loose at night, they're going to head that direction. Well, the other night, my hounds headed in a direction for that property that had recently sold i had no idea who owned that property i simply opened up my onyx app found the landowner information cut the dogs off and the next day i went to their house and not only did i get permission to hunt there i think i made some new friends they are beef farmers and they do not like raccoons running through the feed bunks leaving their mess behind yeah Go to onxmaps.com and download the app today at checkout. Make sure you use the promo code HXP20 and get 20% off. When you join us on Patreon, you will get a discount code for a deeper discount on Onyx Maps. Know where you stand with Onyx. It doesn't take much to kill a cat. Uh, we, we've killed a number of cats with 22 Magnums, but we've also had some messes some train wrecks mm -hmm. too, uh, just because um you know you have to put dogs on a cat that that's not in a tree again that you know that's on the ground and and there's right. always potential you you put your dogs in harm's way um different outfitters have different theories on bow hunters um i kind of subscribe to the theory that if you have to shoot it with a bow once you release an arrow, once you put an arrow in the cat, he's all yours. I'm yeah. not going to put dogs in it again. When I work, worked with Bill and hunted, hunted with Bill, we had a dog run into a bear that was on the ground that took, the dog took the broadhead that was protruding out of the bear into the chest and killed him. Mm. You know, it's kind of a freak thing, but, right. you know, you wouldn't send your kid in there to grab the bear. <laughs> right. So, and I, I think that's, um, I think that's reasonable at that point because a lot of, I have nothing against people wanting to take game with archery equipment. I've bow hunted my whole life. Uh, at some point though, there's a responsibility of the person of the hunter to, to take a real look at the situation and make a, make a responsible decision, whether or not I'm going to shoot this with my bow, or I'm going to go ahead and use the rifle that, that I've got my buddies packing or my outfitters packing. Yeah, I, I mean, to an archery hunter, killing something with a rifle is abhorrent. You know, sure. they just can't bring themselves to want to do it. But often a cat doesn't um, present a very good shot. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, a lot of times you can move that cat around, even put him in a different tree. Uh, sometimes you have to do that to sex a cat. or Right. Um, so so you do have that advantage. And, and generally you have time, unless you have a cat that just won't sit still. But um but One yeah, of the things uh, that I use to reposition cats in the trees just for photographs a lot of times is uh, it's just a varmint call. 
you know, it's a coon squalor that we use back here. And you pull the dogs back and blow, you know, blast away on that, that varmint call a little bit. And they'll, they'll get curious and they'll look and they'll reposition. A lot of times they'll stand up on the limb to get a better look. And there's your shot. Yeah, that's probably, that's something I haven't tried. We've tried the old beat the tree with a frozen stick. And they always jump when they do that. When I do that, try to make snow, snowballs out, out of powder. <laughs> you know, that, that is so frustrating. But, uh, yeah, back yeah. in the day, we used to try to jump cats out. Sure. I, I don't mess with that too much anymore. But yeah. well, when you talked, you, said, you said something earlier about broadhead selection. And like I said, I'm all for guys. I'm, a, I'm an archery, archery hunter myself. So when you're talking about broadhead selection, uh, what's your recommendation there, Phil? You know, broadheads cut hair. They cut hair on entrance uh, more severely than on, on exit. But but even expanding broadheads cut hair on when they enter mm -hmm. often. And cut hair is is not good. What happens if you have a, a a lot of cut hair? You have to cut the skin out where the hair is cut. And um, a, a lot of times um, on the exit, you can just if it's a three blade or a four blade, you can just pull those points together because the velocity of the arrow is, is such that it doesn't cut hair too bad. Or if you do cut hair, oft times that decides for you which side of your cat is going to be the show side. Right, right. And, and then the other thing is uh, if there's a lot of cut hair and we have to take something out, say the size of a banana, um, th that affects the size of the skin. Mm-hmm. And we reshave these skins after we've tanned them or after they come back from the tannery. And the tans that we use have a lot of give and take. So you can still keep some proportions, but there are places, especially on legs, that you do not want to have to remove much skin because there's not a lot there to, to draw from anyways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I would say a smaller broadhead, um, a fixed blade broadhead, you don't need a blood trail. You have a dog. Right. You know? Right. You can always walk it up with a leash, but uh, or a lead on your dog. So, so would you stay away from uh, the expandable, expandable broadheads for, for yeah. cats then? Yeah. I mean, no. and, and I get cats every year that I know are shot with those things, but mm -hmm. they're just messier. They're, they yeah. are messy. When it's, when a smaller fixed blade is going to do the same job. Like you said, you got a dog there. Yeah, and it's all where you hit that cap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a, a, a broadhead is lethal as can be. I right. mean, as much or more so than any bullet. It just doesn't have that initial shocking power. But uh, if it's put in the right place, I mean, I've watched cats just slump over and, and die in the hang up in the tree from a broadhead. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Right. All right. So we got we've got our we got that taken care of. Let's talk about. Now it's on the ground. And I'm not talking about a guy that's, well, I mean, maybe you, you will run into this. I've seen some outfitters or some guides that uh, uh, were more concerned about doing it quick than doing it right. So what do we do once we get there? I, I remember the first line I skinned. Um, you know, like I said, I was used to, to skinning coons and trapping fox and coyotes and and now all of a sudden you got to take these paws off and, and be careful around the face and the head and all this stuff. So what do we do? How do, yeah, we, lions how do we attack are, this? Lions are pretty easy to skin. You know, they don't have layered fat like, or fat like a coon or a bear. You know, mm -hmm. it's all separated. It's, it's layered. But um, I, be, before you have even take a knife to it, um, I, I would recommend – doing a little research if it's new to you on, on how to take good pictures, you know, just because that moment will never happen again. And I, I look back at uh, some of the earlier hunts that I wish we'd have taken a little bit of time. And often, you know, there's duress there. It's getting dark. It's cold. It's mm -hmm. snowing. It's blizzard. We're on this ledge. It's super steep ground. I mean, we had to tie, tie a leg off to even skin it. You know, th there are some challenges about winter hunting and photography as well as skinning, but um, make sure you get pictures you want. And 
to me, I like to standing point. Generally, when somebody calls me and uh, they say, I killed a cat and we're going to send it to you. The first thing we ask them is we'll put you in the system. We'll start a file on you. Send us, email us a kill photo. Mm -hmm. And then most of the guys I do work for, I've never met or a lot of them. And then I have a face to go with the name. And then I have a cat to go with the face. And, you know, just gives me an idea of what we're working with. Um, you can, you can on a good photographer can make a cat look superhero, you know, right. a, a good Tom look like a great Tom, mm -hmm. but all poor picture can make a giant Tom look, look pedestrian, very mediocre. And so, uh, I get people that, um, I mean, I've seen enough dead cats and I've handled enough dead cats. I can look at a decent picture and get an idea of what kind of cat it is skin wise, how it's going to mount up. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to measurements and weights, um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't debate that with people. If somebody says their cat was 200 pounds, I just say that's awesome because we charge by the pound. <laughs> that, <laughs> right. That's right. My, my phone, Chris. I'm going to. That's no problem. Yeah. Um, so that, that goes into a good point. Even knowing how to set this stuff up, I've taken seen pictures of bears that I actually skinned and packed out. The, the photos were taken by other people. And, and when the, you actually see the photos they took, it looked like a small bear, but it wasn't a yeah. small bear. It was just the way it was all positioned. You know, I, I, I worked with uh, uh, Hunter Meekham and, and Wade Hollerman down in, on the Paloma this past year, and taking pictures was a big part of it, and they took excellent pictures, and it was the way they set bears up, and, and, and they do the same thing with lions. You can tell such a great story with a good photo and give you something to work with. And if you're a houndsman, get pictures of those dogs. I've, got, I've had dogs over the years that I wish I'd – got in the pictures and uh you know there are guys that are really good at that uh, I, the, when they tie them dogs up in the background don't put your dogs in front of the cat either you right know, you'll see a right. lot of, a lot of times a guy's trying to do the heimlich and and hold this cat <laughs> up and there's there's a dog chewing on its leg or in the foreground and right. you think well if that's a 150 pound cat that's a 160 pound dog exactly you know? so, so <laughs> exactly. there i mean if the, if that kind of stuff's important to you, but but you should you should take pictures of your dogs, right? Uh, right. Then you know you can remember who was there because trust me, your memory will go at some point. And to what be was your to name help, again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you you, you want to be able to pass that stuff on to to even your unborn sure. grandchildren, you know? Absolutely. So, what are some of the things that you've seen? Um, you know, come into the shop and and you're like, man, this guy did this, this right. Why don't you just explain, um, you know, what a good skinning job looks like. Good field yeah. skinning job. I have a skinning diagram and I'm going to pin it at the very top of my Instagram. Um, our, our website, we just haven't, we've neglected it, but we are rebuilding one now. Um, I get a lot of requests. How do you want me to skin the cat? Guys text me from the field. And, and I will, yeah. I'll, send, I'll send them this diagram. Um, I like to have everything intact. Um, I, I, I don't want you to slice through the anus, orthoscrotum, like, like circumvent those things. And it's very clear in the diagram. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter how you do it. But um, as long as it's all there and there's not a lot of jagged saw blade cuts mm -hmm. or a lot of cut hair, um, it, it, it'll work fine. But once you cut through the anus of a cat, um, or, or the scrotum, it, it limits, um, it no longer becomes pristine. You know, there's, there's man, something man-made there that has to be repaired. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that I'm a real stickler about is I do, I do not, if you look in my life-size skinning diagram, I do not like to, I like to make a cross, a four-way at the chest, but I like it low in the chest. And I like the upper part of that cross. It only needs to be an inch long, the, 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 the upper, um, the, t the top part that extends through the paw to paw incision. Uh, I, it, it can be a couple of inches, but just because if you make it a capital T up there, 
you don't know where those flaps from the that come up around from under the front four legs, you don't know where they connect in at. But if you have a four-way intersection, you know all four of those points go together. That that helps. Uh, okay. You don't you don't get a lot of that. Um, even so, so I'm not going to. Can I ask you some questions here, real quick? Because I'm looking at your diagram right now. Mm -hmm. um, and let's just clarify that when we start, I've got tons of questions here and to help to help clarify some of this stuff. When so you let's just look, look at the the one in white that doesn't have the rug right, cut. Right. Mm -hmm. So so when we're we're starting this skinning job, where would you start on this cougar? I go paw to paw, and and you can cut through the the, the pads but you don't need to because you're going to cut the feet off it and leave them in the skin in the field mm -hmm. you do not need to skin the toes out there but i go front paw to front paw and i like to stay an inch to an inch and a half above the elbow so it's 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 ra rather close to the tricep and around mm -hmm. the back part of of the armpit like you would cape a deer actually yeah so your first cut is front pad to front pad and mm -hmm. following those lines and we're going to post this with the uh the release of the the episode for sure and then after you make that cut where you where are you moving to next phil well i'll start about three inches down on the tail and i'll or, you, you can either go heel to heel that incision uh it doesn't matter but you want to have a four-way down there um a lot of times I will keep the anus on one flap and the scrotum, the hardware on the, on the, on another flank flap. Okay. But, um, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, but when you make that cut up the belly, you want to keep it in the center and mm -hmm. you, and you want to, and you want to go through just a short distance when you get to the chest. Um, we're but it going, doesn't matter. We're but going, I'm going up, up mm -hmm. uh, against the hair rather than with the hair. If you go with the hair, um, you tend to catch more hair with your blade. Okay. So, so I'm so, going from, a, from the back of the cat towards the front. Okay, so when I'm going forward and then I get to that intersection where I went paw to paw on the front, then you want me to go ahead and, and go an additional inch or so beyond that. So to yeah, make just, just go straight across to where you have a four-way intersection there. Four yeah. corners, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let's talk about, uh, you know, where, where we get into that joint on the front foot or, or on the, any of the feet, uh, front feet seem to skim for me different than they do back feet. So where are you recommending? You can skin it completely. Uh, you can skin a lion without a bone saw. Let's just say that. Yeah, e easily. Um, you can, you can just see where that wrist bends there's a lot of bones in the wrist. So it's not like just two bones that touch each other. Mm -hmm. So if, if you, if you're cutting bone, just move a little up or down. Um, but you've got to find a gap in there. And what I like to do is to like pull, pull the, the toes back against themselves. That tightens all the tendons in the lower part of uh, the, the underside of the wrist. And when you hit, start hitting those with a sharp knife, I mean, you can feel the the, the claws and the bone, the toe bones relax. And so, you know, you're getting in the right place there. Mm -hmm. And you just, you just kind of, without showing somebody, it's difficult to <laughs> describe. Right. In fact, a lot of times I have to relearn it in the field. Um, on Me the back, too. the back legs, you want to just cut that Achilles and, and that, that joint at the hawk. Mm -hmm. um, there's also s some smaller bones in there and you, and you just, once you cut the Achilles, you can see where it hinges. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've got the body, uh, and then we're going to pull this. Once we get the tail skinned out, we get all this worked up. We get it worked up to the, to the, uh, you know, the, the front legs. Then what do you, are you just pulling that towards the head at that point? Yeah, I think it, uh, as far as skinning the tail, you, you don't have to skin the tail in the field. The tail is very thin, um, and it and it has deep hair follicles, and it's and it it's a place where they store a lot of fat. 
Mm -hmm. And so if you're experienced and you're comfortable with it, um, you could go ahead and do it. But I, I like to skin it down just a few inches and cut it off in the field. It's just, it, you can have a more controlled cut down the center uh, in, a, in a controlled environment. And what I like to do is, is skin one side of the cat, clear around to the spine, and then roll it over and skin the other part, get the tail as far down as you can. There's quite a bit of flexibility to a green skin. So, so it's not sure. like it's tight on there and cut the tail off again. You can find joints, a little saw, it would be helpful there because they are vertebrae and they interlock mm -hmm. but, uh, at the base of the tail. Um, and then try to pull everything to where you're, you're going to have it hanging off the head end of it. And then you may have to roll the, the carcass left to right and just work, the left side, work the right side, top and bottom. One thing you want to be really careful of is not to skin to a point where you're going to cut the ear cartilage because the ears are set very deep into the head. Mm -hmm. And if you stick your finger uh, into the ear hole from the outside, you can have an idea how that cartilage is, is uh, you know, how, how much it protrudes out and where it's at. Um, but, but you can cut a cat's head off. By, by finding the atlas and and removing the, the skull at, at that last bone joint. Gotcha. Yeah, don't worry about doing the fine work in the field. We're trying to get out of there. We've already taken the pictures, and, and it's getting dark on us, and we're cold and we're hungry, and let's do the fine work or let you do the fine work. Yeah, it's far. I mean, I, I've never skinned a head out in the field on the carcass. I've done it in the shop, you know, just mm -hmm. for reference so I can – have a cast or photographs or something, but yeah. And the same with feet. So just throw the feet and tail in the head in a, in a game bag, strap it to your pack. Um, don't drape it over your shoulders. If you have plots or blue ticks, um, <laughs> <laughs> you hit both of the ones that I'm hunting right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have a blue tick and you cannot carry a bobcat out, out of the field with him. He, he just, he will get it from you. So yeah. you have to get it in, in a pack. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I understand. I understand. All right. So now, uh, you know, obviously a lot of us, you know, we're not going to stop by your shop on the way home. So let's talk about me getting this critter to the house. And I've got to, I'm going to end up shipping this to you. What are yeah. the things that I need to do? with this hide once I get it home. We've got the we and we've got the feet, we've got the head, and we've got the tail still in the hide. So how do I preserve that before I get it shipped to you? So a lot of times if it, if it's a big cat and the guy wants to measure the skull, um if you've never skinned a cat head, you could do it. But there's some things that you need to know. You know, you want to when you get to the ears, you want to have your finger down in that ear hole and you want to pull it away because you've got to actually go deep into the skull to where the ear canal is the size of a pencil you know to have everything that that we like to have yeah when you get to the eyes you want to stick your finger in the eye socket and pull, pull the back corner of the eyelid away um otherwise you, you'll cut the eyelids out and and stay very close to the bone it's the same with the nose uh, it's like caping a deer without the mm -hmm. antlers so um you can ship it with the head in it. The advantage to that is it will stay colder longer. Um, you can ship it with the tail in it, but you might want to take the tail out. Uh, okay. If, if, you're, if you're comfortable doing that, because a big fat tail on a Tom is, is bulky and it doesn't, I mean, you can, you can fold it, you know, wrap it pretty small. Uh, the thing that I would recommend is if you are a day or two there with your friends, buy a cheap cooler. But find a box that's insulated um, or a box that you can get into a cooler. A lot of times guys will just put the cat in a, in a black bag and put it in the freezer and mm -hmm. it's 36 inches long or 30 inches long. And then they, they have to thaw it to put it in what they're going to ship it in. Uh, a lot of times let, get that, let that skin cool out. You know, um, generally it's cold when you're lion hunting, mm -hmm. but, if you roll it up tight and it's hot and it's warm, uh, when you put it in your pack, take it out, hang it over some sawhorses in the garage or whatever, where the, the dogs can't get to it. I had, had one we're working on now that they put it on the picnic table at the lodge and they turned the dogs loose and then dogs ran off with it. And 
<laughs> Needless to say, we're going to be doing a lot of sewing on that Plot, one. Plots and blue ticks. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to stereotype. <laughs> but uh, but they were energetic dogs, and they they played tug of war with that thing for a while before these guys discovered right. <laughs> that they had it. So, yeah, that's another thing too, and and I know I'm going to probably step on some toes here. I do not I do not let my dogs wool anything. Uh, if if there's a young dog there and he wants to bite uh, the back end of a cat a little bit, I'll, I'll let him. But I have seen, especially bobcats and lynx, I have seen where guys have allowed dogs to bite them. And it's not that the dog necessarily will even do a lot of damage. If they're pulling hair, obviously, you do not want to have that. But there is saliva in a dog's mouth. And when he bites, uh, a lot of times he, he creates a saliva knot in that fur. Hmm. And those tanneries, they don't comb those skins out before they drum them. They'll, they'll wash them. They'll, they'll flesh and or they'll pickle and shave them. And then they'll oil them, let them dry. And then they'll drum them in a tumbler full of sawdust. What happens, and I've, I've noticed it on lions, but especially on bobcats and lynx, um, where those saliva knots, those little, where the dogs bite, uh, it creates a dreadlock. And that dreadlock is tangled up in sawdust with fur that's already yeah. in the drum and it it creates a fur knot hmm. and they're they're almost impossible to pick out uh the only thing worse or as bad are pitch natural pitch balls sure that, that yeah in the drum actually heat up and and form right to the to the hair so a lot of those things have to be pulled out the good thing about bobcats and lynx is that they have a lot of fur and they're very fairly forgiving but dreadlocks in mountain lions, I mean, it wouldn't be an issue as much with an Arizona cat. Right. But broken hair would be a lot more obvious because it's, you know, a, a yeah. desert cat. They don't have much short. hair anyway. So when I, um, I, I, I've, I'm pretty careful about telling guys, don't let your dogs wool, wool an animal or, or chew on an animal. But I, I, th that is something that it it's took a me a long time. That yeah, it's a problem that's I'm presented to for you. Out what caused mm -hmm. that, and and now I I understand what the dangers are. So just be aware of that. Sure. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, outstanding. I never even thought about that because I'm not a taxidermist and I'm not on your end of it trying to pick these things out. You know, that's what sets yeah. you apart, Phil. Well, you know, I think that, every everybody that deals with damaged skins has to you know wants to figure out what caused this and how could it be prevented sure absolutely most man-made damage is preventable mm -hmm. you know throwing a cat in the back of your truck and driving around and having an exhaust leak i've had cats that actually the skin was cooked um from an exhaust leak that heated the bed of an old truck and and actually when i skinned that cat you could tell it was it had a, a spot that you know the size of a hubcap on the rib cage that was all kind of transparent and when it went through the tan you couldn't stretch it. It just tore like wet tissue. And no kidding. I never even yeah. heard of that before. Uh, snowmobile too. I mean, ha had a cat's head drag on crusty snow and just looks completely bald on one side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, uh, with side by sides, you got to be a pay. You have to pay attention to where your exhaust is coming out on snowmobiles, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Lot to think about. Lot to think about. And sure. the, so um what else are we missing here, Phil? What uh, what other piece of pieces of advice can you give us from you know well back standpoint? to the shipping part of it? Here, here's what we recommend. We get guys that, that call us all the time. How do I send my cat to you? Mm -hmm. And everybody in the shop has this spiel down, and it is ship it no later than a Tuesday. And if it's winter, you know, December, January, February, ship it second day air, put it in an insulated box. The moment you sh and insure it for 1500 bucks or something. So they have some skin in the game. And when you ship it, you send me a tracking number immediately and mm -hmm. notify me that you shipped it. 
we have a board uh, clipboard on the wall by the door and everything the moment it's shipped we we put it um, we check that box and then when it arrives we check that box and we contact the, the client or the outfitter but w we had a situation a couple of weeks ago where a guy i bumped into him at the expo and he's like man i've got this cat it's been in my freezer since last year and it's one of my really good clients and i'm gonna i'll send it to you and you know things get busy and he ended up sending it on a tuesday but he sent it through the post office and he sent it priority mail and they said oh it'll, it'll get there by friday mm -hmm. he says is it guaranteed and somehow there was a misunderstanding because he had said he had talked to my wife and Barbara would have never, never told him go USPS. If you do go express. However, we had one that went express last week and it didn't get here till Monday because we're not open on Saturday mm -hmm. and they may show up on Saturday to the shop and they're, they're not going to leave it without a signature if it's express. So um, UPS is, is the second most reliable here. FedEx seems to be more on top of their air. I think they just mm. have a better, better fleet of planes. Um, but even if you're shipping it from Missoula and it has to go to Nashville hub and come here, at least they are guaranteed. They're supposedly guaranteeing that now post COVID all bets are off, but right. send it there. If it's warmer weather, like we've had some days in the sixties now, I'm sure it's warmer in other parts of the country. I, I encourage people to overnight it, put yeah. some insulin you can put it in a cardboard box. You can put just some fiberglass you know, R19 around it. You can put foam peanuts around it. You can find a, an old styrofoam cooler and put it in a box. Just something. That foam, especially if the head's in it, a cat uh, in, a, in an unheated warehouse will last five days and still have ice in it if it's yeah. in a cooler. So th that's cheap insurance. Sure. Um, just the world is not as on time as it used to be. COVID changed things. Uh, and, you know, flights... Well, we don't guarantee that anymore. Right. They used to, but so. Anything else you can think of? No, I think that covers getting the cat to us. Great, man. I'll tell you what, you've given me a lot of stuff to think about. As you were talking about that box, I was think you know, insulated box and, and all of that stuff. I'm thinking in my mind how I'm going to build an insulated box when I, when I ship a, a lion out to you to, to get mounted sometime. So, uh, but if you said, did you say Missoula and then it has to go to the hub? If it if, goes air, if I'm in Missoula, I'm driving it to your shop. Yeah. You it'll be a little that. bit of a haul, but it'll be a nice drive. <laughs> I've got a, but I've got a buddy in Butte that I, I hunted, used to hunt with a lot and uh, we, we still hunt together a little bit, but he's kind of a central hub. Uh, when we came back from the expo, we picked up, four or five lions from him and i've got another one going there kevin picked one up last weekend coming back from the state taxidermy competition so yeah 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 well phil um can can you tell our listeners where they can find you on social media and you said your website you're redoing it right now but i've been to it it looks great um but can you let people know where they can find you and and um, follow follow your work yeah, it's mainly just pictures, uh, but on Instagram, our handle is catman406. Uh, I haven't been posting. I've been kind of staying away from Facebook just because it's. I find myself going down these wormholes. And <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I would like to, to emphasize is I started this business um, and there were guys that taught me a lot of this stuff. And then there were things I discovered on my own. But without those guys, I probably would have never gained the tools to figure figure some of this stuff out. Mm -hmm. And so th those guys deserve a, a lot of recognition for, for how I've developed as an artist, as a taxidermist. My dad was an artist, a painter. And, uh, and so I, I th think genetically I got some of that. So, uh, but... When I first started, people would say, man, I want you to mount my cat. I don't want anyone else to touch it. Mm -hmm. And when I was working alone, I did. But it's very easy for a guy to work alone to burn out. 
it's very easy to get distracted when you don't have anybody else in the shop. And so after I got hired my first guy, I, I recognized the value in that. Mm -hmm. And we have developed a team. Look at it as if um, you are going to restore a frame up restoration on a classic car. You know, the same guy that does your paint and body is not the guy that does your upholstery. And right. the guys that I have in the shop, there, there's five of us, there's six actually, uh, and then Barbara, but one of them is a production manager and, and he was a home builder. He was a general contractor and this frees him up. He, he works in the shop a few hours every day, but if it, it keeps me off the phone and on the floor. And if somebody wants to deal directly with me, you know, I'll, I'll talk to him for sure. But, um, Dave is so good at what he does. He allows me to work where I'm, I'm the strongest. Uh, I have a lead taxidermist, Kevin Knighty. If, if you have a cat done here, he's the one putting the skin on it. He's setting mm -hmm. the eyes he's doing skin application. He can mount a Phil Susie cat better than me because, <laughs> because I've actually invested a day or two or three into making that mannequin fit the skin yeah very 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 well so the foundation is there he can frame it up and then uh, brandon he'll sew it chris pours forms and and jimmy handles all the habitat kevin does the finish work Jim, jimmy handles habitat and shipping we ship about 90 percent of the cats we mount yeah and so and so we could there's no way that i could do what i do anything close to the scale in which we do it and and we're not huge We've decided this year we're going to take in 80 mountain lions and, and we're not going to cut it off. But if you want to go beyond 80, then we're not going to give you a guaranteed date and you're going to get next year's pricing. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take in unlimited amount of leopards, which is, you know, between 25 and 35 a year usually. Right. And we, we turn away as many bobcats as we can. Um, a lot of times we'll have guys that will go to Canada and kill a bobcat and a lion or lynx and a lion. And we still take in a lot of lynx. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but right now I'm in the process of sculpting some new forms. Uh, all of these cats come from about two forms. They're all altered mannequins. And, and so now I'm, I'm working with the guy uh, to mold some new forms. We're actually doing looking into 3D printing the molds which no is going way. to re revolutionize what, what we're trying. And we'll still have to lay fiberglass mat and, and resin up to, to up structurally shore them up to handle expansion, expanding mm -hmm. foam. And but to get that initial shell printed without even having uh, to, to mold a form is, is going to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. What's the most exotic cat that you've done? Have I seen a snow leopard? Have you done a snow we leopard? Have done a, we have done a snow leopard. Uh, we've done a, not, now we haven't done a lot of these. We've done one jaguar, one snow leopard, and one tiger. Uh, oh, of course, man. We've, done, we've done a fair amount of, you know, African lions and, and mm -hmm. a lot of leopards. Uh, we have a black leopard that we're getting ready to do for the world show uh, this next cycle, and which is in August. And so Forest Heart, uh, a grand old gentleman sculptor, uh, a sage, is going to come out for his fourth time, and we're going to try for a four-peat in the collective artist division. He's coming out next month, and we're going to model model this uh, black leopard. And uh, Amazing. Yeah. So, so can you see the spots? Can you still see the spots on the black leopard, or are they real You real know, I found uh, this cat was raised uh, by a guy that has animals of Montana, and I saw some of the pictures on his Facebook page where you could see the rusty spots, mm -hmm. but I think it's more of a seasonal thing. And I think when they put this cat down, it, it's pretty black. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to wash it and blow it out and see, but I could not see much going on there. Yeah. Well, interesting stuff. Phil, I know you're a busy guy. I, I really can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time out of your day. I, I, it's great to talk to a lion hunter. I hope people will, uh, you know, listen to the things that you have to say and, and help them. There just isn't anything worse than, 
then you spend on all this time, all this effort, your money, and then you you make a simple mistake that that ruins the the memory for you, you know, and makes your job harder. It's, yeah. it's a travesty, I mean, really. We talked to a, a fair amount of a few guys that that have taxidermy remorse, mm-hmm. but all in all, there are some very good taxidermists out there, and mm-hmm. we we don't want all the cats for sure. There, there are some guys out there that are doing some amazing stuff. And if, if it's a lot of times cost is a factor for people. And, you know, if if some young guy comes along, I'll try to work with him. But for the most part, the the majority of the clients that we work with money, isn't the issue. Time is the biggest issue for them. So, uh, but there, there's a lot of good taxidermists out there. So yeah, for sure. For sure. And where did you say your website, what's your web address so people can go there and check it out? philipsusi.com. P-H-I-L-I-P-S-O-U-C-Y.com. All right. Well, Phil, I, I appreciate your time today and helping us uh, get a few tips there to to make your yeah. life easier and every other taxidermist in the world. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. All right, Chris. Take All right. care. You bet. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast. Make sure you're checking out all Phil's work on Instagram. He's got some amazing photos. That's Catman406, and his website is philipsusi.com. You can check out all of our merchandise and everything that we offer over on houndsmanxp.com. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. This is Fair Chase.